Okay, so welcome back everybody to our One World Seminar Series. We are proud to have here with us today, Omer Tammuz from Caltech, who had to wake up quite early in the morning for that. Uh, the research of Omer uh, is in a wide range of topics, social learning, learning on networks, measure theory, and ergodic theory, and even voting rooms. Um, and Omer, uh, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um, game theory is not one of the things you mentioned, so I don't think really I'm a game theorist, but um, <laughs> there, there'll be a little bit of games today, not, not a lot. Um, okay, so th this is uh, Private Private Information. It's joined with Kevin Hay, who's at University of Pennsylvania, and Fedor Sandomirsky, who's a postdoc here at Caltech. He also has a position in St. Petersburg. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll dive right into it. Um, I'm going to describe something very simple, just the concept of private information. So we're going to have a finite set of agents. We're going to have a state of nature omega. There'll be some common prior, which I'll denote by P for this omega. Um, each agent is going to take a, get a private signal SI, which takes values in some set capital SI about omega. And this will be our private information. And what we're going to call an information structure is some joint distribution over the state and these and these signals. Okay, so we're going to think about these just as random variables. They're all going to be in some big probability space that, that we'll, we'll use the same probability space where we'll recycle it throughout the talk. Um, this talk, I'm going to focus on the case of two agents and a bi binary state. Um, some of the results generalize beyond this to say finitely many agents and finitely many possible values of the state, um, and some don't. Um, you can read more in the paper. If you're interested, you can ask me and I can explain what generalizes and what doesn't. But I'll just focus on two agents and a binary state that takes two values low and high. Okay, so some examples of private information structure. One is public signals, where all these signals are the same with, with probability one. Um, another very standard one is conditionally independent signals. So given omega, these S's are drawn independently um, across agents. So this is very standard. The idea is, for example, omega is something that I'm going to measure, and the measurement error is independent between agents. And well, in some sense, these are not really private. I mean, public signals are obviously not private, but even conditionally independent signals are not really private. So what do I mean by that? Imagine that I have a uniform prior over this binary state. And each agent is just told the state with, and, and what they're told is correct with probability 90%. So if agent one learns, uh, gets a high signal, now he has really high belief in the high state. So he's going to assign very high belief to the event that agent two got a high signal. So when I see my signal, that gives me a lot of information about your signal. So in some sense, there's, it's not really private information in the sense that I know a lot about what you got, even if I don't know what it is exactly. So what we're going to do is we're going to focus on a special case of private, private, of private information, which is private, private information, really private, private information. And it's just the case where these signals are independent of each other. Okay, so this is the one main, one or two main definitions in, 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 in this talk. I'm just looking at the case where these signals are independent of each other. They're independent, not conditionally independent. Okay, so conditionally independent signals in general um, are not going to be actually independent. And I do want them to be able to contain information about the state. So each one of them, you know, to make it interesting should be correlated somehow with the state, but I don't want them to contain information about each other. So in particular, agent I, when she sees her signal SI, learns nothing at all about um, SJ. So if you ask her before and after she observed her own signal, what is her belief about the other signal? Well, these are independent random variables. So I don't, she doesn't learn anything about the other signals. Okay, so the first question is, is, is this even possible? Yeah, how is it possible that all these S's are independent of each other, but they're all correlated with the same thing? So here's a very, um, here's a very simple example. Take, Choose S1 and S2 
independent, say, standard Gaussians. And now choose omega to be high if their sum is positive and low if their sum is negative. So S1 and S2 are independent of the state. Are in, sorry, are not independent of the state. They're independent of each other. But both of them are correlated with the state, right? If I, if I get a very high S1, then I can be pretty confident that the state is high. And same for S2, even if those two signals are independent of each other. So this is a, a simple example of a private-private information structure with two agents and a binary state. The state is either high or low. The signals don't have to be binary. The signals in this case are, are real numbers. Um, so, so it is possible for them to be independent, but there is some tension between how informative they can be while maintaining privacy. So I can't, for example, have a private-private structure where the signals completely reveal the state, because then if I know that the signal revealed, my signal revealed to me that the state is high, it has to be that yours revealed to you that the state is high. It can't be that yours revealed to you that the state is lower. We'd be agreeing to, you know, that there, there's some violation of agreeing to disagree here, the Martingale property or something. Okay, so, so this is the tension that we study in this paper. Oh, by the way, I never asked, how long is this talk? The talk is one hour, and then it is followed by uh, a discussion that is flexible, depending okay. on okay. the question. Okay. okay, good. I planned for one. Um, if anybody wants to start the discussion now, any thoughts or questions? <laughs> um, th this, this so far should be very simple, So, um, but if anything is unclear, I'm, I'm glad to discuss. I guess the biggest question at this point is why is this even interesting? So I'll, I'll, I'll hopefully get to that. Okay, so I'll, I'll continue. Oh, Omer, this. maybe? Uh, yeah, 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 please. Um, can, can, can we say that uh, such thing could be represented by, by more or less your example? If I have a family of random variables, which are independent, and yep. then I draw omega from some transition from the vector uh, S1 and Sn, then that's what this thing should be? Um, by transition, you mean I draw it maybe with some additional randomness, right? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, more generally, it's just a collection of n plus one random variables where omega and then S1 up to Sn, where S1 up to Sn are independent random variables. So, right, so, 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 so this is really the mathematical object that we're studying. Okay, thank you, that's a, that's a good question. Okay, so here's how the talk is gonna go. Um, I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about motivation. Um, I'll give some examples and then, then I'll give a sort of a representation theorem for these information structures up to a certain notion of equivalence, uh, which will be Blackwell equivalence. Um, I'm gonna talk about how informative they can be. I'm gonna characterize Pareto optimal signals and Pareto optimal will be with respect to the Blackwell order. Uh, Pareto optimal private private information structures. And this will turn out to be a perhaps interesting connection with tomography. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about all this. Um, and um, I'm gonna talk about one application, which is sort of our main application, is what is the optimal signal that you can generate under the constraint of not revealing some sensitive information? I'll explain this. And then I'll talk about the feasibility of joint posterior belief distributions, which distributions you can even have. Okay, so that, that's the plan. Let's talk about motivation. So here's one sort of not very um, formal motivation, just sort of there's nothing mathematical here, but imagine that yeah, you own a consulting company and you sell information about something, about some state, and you have many customers, and some of these customers are competitors. Now, these customers might want to have a privacy guarantee. If they buy some information from you, they don't want anybody else to know the piece of information that you got from. They're competing with your other customers. In fact, it's not just that they don't want somebody to know exactly what they got. They don't want anybody to have any information about the, the information that they got. So this makes the information that's sold to all these competitors a private-private information structure, right? So you're selling information to all these different people, 
and you don't want any of them to know anything about what you sold to the others, this forces you to have a private, private information structure. And then the natural question is how informative can I make this? How much information can I actually sell? If you imagine that I make more money, the more information I sell. I can't just completely inform everybody. That would not be private, private anymore. So there's some tension here be between how much can I sell and how private these things can be. Okay, let's talk about um, here uh, something a bit more formal. Here is, um, this is sort of our, our main application. We have a sender who wants to reveal information about the state omega. So we're just going to have a sender and a receiver. And S1 is some sensitive information that's correlated with omega. I'll give some examples later. And the point is that the sender knows omega and S1. The receiver doesn't know either one. The sender sends the signal S2, not about the borrower. So that should be about the, about the state. That's a mistake, sorry, but the sender sends, send, sends, sends a signal about omega, and the requirement is that S2 is independent of S1. So I want to tell you as much as I can about omega without revealing any information about S1. And the question is, how much information can I tell you about omega? And the, here, S1 is not a signal that goes to some agent. It's some information that's out there already. But the pair S1 and S2, they're just independent random variables. And perhaps both of them are somehow correlated with the state. So the question is, if I fix omega and S1, how informative can I make S2? What's the most informative that S2 can be while still remaining independent of S1? So here are two examples. One is the sender is a credit rating agency. The receiver is a bank. And omega is an applicant's credit worthiness. So somebody wants to be approved for a loan. The bank outsources this um, task to an agency who goes and does the research about this person. And the agency tells them, agency figures out omega, whether this person should be given a loan or not. But the agency also learns S1, which is some legally protected traits, so age, gender, race. And they're, not, they're legally not allowed to reveal any information about this to the bank. So the question is, what is the most information this credit rating agency can give to the bank without revealing any of this information that they're not allowed to reveal? Here's a sillier, but maybe more fun example. Imagine that, say, the United States wants to prove to the world that North Korea has a, a, a nuclear um, program or a nuclear bomb. Okay, this is an old example by now. And what they want to do is they want to reveal some intelligence that they have about the nuclear program that will prove that North Korea is doing things that they're not supposed to do. So the sender here is, is the country, the United States, the receiver is the international community. The state is maybe say the location of their weapons facility, but they don't wanna reveal the source of their intelligence. So S1 is gonna be the identity of their spy. And maybe S1 is correlated with the location, right? If I, um, if I tell you that the, um, that the nuclear reactor is in some place, maybe that raises the probability that the spy lives in that place. So now I want to reveal as much as to intelligence as I want as much about Omega, but we're revealing no information at all about the identity of this spy. Okay, um, last motivation, and then I'll start actually talking about results. Um, and this is going to be about persuasion in zero sum games. So players one and two. And by the way, any questions about about this optimal private disclosure application? Omel? Yeah. Hi. I might be wrong, but your story at least sounds similar to the field of zero knowledge proof. But is there a similarity between the the two or just in the story? I, I, I don't see a formal similarity. It would be cool if there was. Maybe I should think about it some more, but I, I haven't thought about this so far. So I, I my feeling right, just... It's gut exactly feeling right revealing now. one bit and I can prove that nothing beyond that. But, but uh, my, let, I might end with you. Let me think about it. Okay, okay. nice question. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so back to persuasions. There are some games we're gonna have player players one and two are gonna play a game, 
And we're going to have a designer, an like information designer, who knows some state omega and has a utility that depends on the state and on the player's actions. So the utility of the designer depends on the, the state omega that the designer knows and the actions of the two players. So this is sort of a standard you know, Bayesian persuasion thing, except that the players are playing a game rather than usually it's just one player. The players don't care at all about their state. Their utilities only depend on their action profile. Now, what we're going to have is the designer is going to tell them which actions to take. This is like a direct revelation thing. The designer tells them which actions to take. And we're going to, the, the solution concept would be a correlated equilibrium. So, you know, given that each player is told what to do, they're incentivized to, to, to actually do this in the usual correlated equilibrium way. And we're going to focus on zero-sum games that have a unique equilibrium. So that they have a unique Nash equilibrium, they also have unique correlated equilibrium. In that case, well, because there's only one correlated equilibrium, if we look at the designer's recommendations, S1 and S2, this, these are also going to be sort of the mixed strategies that the players are going to play. They have to be independent because there's a unique correlated equilibrium. It has to also be a Nash equilibrium. So, so, so the, the, this, these S1 and S2 have to be independent of each other, which means that omega S1, S2 is a private, private structure. Okay, so if you want to persuade people in a, um, in, a, in, in a game with a unique correlated equilibrium, like a zero-sum game, your, your recommendations have to be independent of each other, even though presumably you want them to be correlated with the state because your utility depends on the interaction between the state and the actions. So, so the designer wants these signals to be correlated with the state, but he has to keep them independent of each other just because that's, that's the incentive compatibility constraint. It has to be a Nash equilibrium. And the question is how well can the designer hope to do? And I, this is sort of, we, we, we don't develop this very far in the paper. I think this, this might be interesting maybe beyond, beyond what we do. And it made us come, come with a side question. So I wrote here that, that we're looking at zero sum gains, but really all we need is that there's a unique correlated equilibrium. And um, there, there's been some work about unique correlated equilibria, games with unique correlated equilibria. For example, um, it's known that a generic zero sum game has a unique correlated equilibrium. It's also known that in the space of games, if you look at the, if you vary the games, in the space of games, those with a unique correlated equilibrium form an open set. So if I take one of these zero sum games, two player zero sum games and perturb it a little bit, it's still going to be, it's still going to have a unique correlated equilibrium. But we, we don't really know about any three player games with non-trivial unique correlated equilibrium. And by non-trivial, I mean that no player plays a pure strategy. So if I have a unique correlated equilibrium, then this correlated equilibrium is also a Nash equilibrium. And what I want is that all three players actually mix. It's very easy to give one player a dominant strategy, and then that player always plays that strategy, and it's not so interesting. So we could not find any example of a game that has a three-player game that has a unique correlated equilibrium, and in this correlated equilibrium, which is a Nash equilibrium, all three players actually mix. And the reason we're interested in it is that all these results about persuasion, some games actually apply to any game with a, with, with a unique correlated equilibrium. We really have no interesting example for three players. Okay, so if anybody has an idea, I'd, I'd be very interested to hear. Okay, so this is it for, for motivation. Any more thoughts or questions? Okay, so let's look at some examples of private-private um, information structures. Um, let's imagine that the probability that the state is high is one half in this example. The signals take value in zero, one. So the x-axis here will be the signal of player one. The y-axis is the signal of player two. And, um, and I'm gonna assume that each, the, the, the distribution the prior a prior distribution on each of these private signal is uniform. These signals are going to be independent. So the, the joint distribution on S1 and S2 is just the uniform distribution on this square. Now, what I'm going to do is when the when 
when when the S1 and S2 are in the in the upper triangle, I'm going to set the state to be high. When it's in the lower triangle, I'm going to set the state to be low. Another way of thinking about this is the following. First, I'll pick the state. When it's high, I choose S1, S2 uniformly from the upper triangle. When it's low, I choose it from the lower triangle. Either way, S1 and S2 are independent, and each one is uniform on 0, 1. And omega equals to h is the event that S1 plus S2 is bigger than a half. So th this is another example of, of what, you know, of thinking about it the way Tristan proposed, except that here h, here omega is the actually deterministic function of the signals. You know, it's, a, it's even a particular case where there's no randomness left after, a, if, if I were to know both signals, there's no randomness left. Now we can look at what is the posterior belief that agent say one has after she observes her signal S1. So say she observes a signal that's over here, 0 0.9, and, and she asks herself, what's the probability that the state is high? So she looks at the line above 0 0.9, all the possible signals that S2 could have gotten, and 90% of them are in the blue region. So given that she saw the signal 0 0.9, her belief is 0 0.9. So in this case, the belief that each SI induces is equal to SI. So both agents will, will have a belief that's uniform on zero one, okay? One of the questions that we'll ask is, which pairs of distributions on zero one correspond to some private-private information structure? That's the feasibility question. Which distributions can I, on, on beliefs, can I get like this? And obviously I can't get any distribution on beliefs because for example, I can't get completely revealing signals where the distribution is half one and, you know, with probability half one with probability half zero. Here's another example. Again, the state is high with probability one half, and we're gonna draw S1 and S2 uniformly, either from the blue or from the white set, depending on the state, if it's high or low. Okay, so when the state is high, we draw S1, S2 uniformly from the blue area. When it's low, we draw it from the white area. Overall, the state, the pair of signals is uniform on the unit square, so so they're independent and and uh, you know, their IID uniform zero. Um, notice that here SI no longer induces belief SI. So let's look at, at at player one. If 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 she gets signal between zero and one fourth, she asks herself, what's the probability that the state is high? That's going to be one fourth. Also here between one fourth and one half. If she looks up, the probability that the state is high is one fourth. Between one half and one, the probability that the state is high is three fourths. So this is actually equivalent to a binary signal that induces beliefs either one fourth or three fourths. What do I mean by equivalent? From the point of view of each player, sure, I get a signal that it takes values on in the interval zero one, but I really don't care about these values so much. I, I really, I mean, you know, for most applications, I would only care about what belief this induces for me. The rest is noise. And the belief is either one fourth or three fourths. So, so after I get rid of, of, of all this noise, I really only care about whether the signal is below or above one half. Um, and, and so this is really equivalent to a binary signal. Does this make sense? It's equivalent for each player for a binary to a binary signal. So, so we can get binary signals um, that are at private private structure where both players have binary signals that are three fourths, one fourth. And you can ask yourself, can we do better than that? Can we get binary, we can't get binary signals that are revealing, but can we get 0 0.9, 0 0.1? It turns out that the answer is that for binary, symmetric binary signals, this is the most informative that it, that it gets. You, can, you cannot get anything higher than three fourths. Um, this is related to a different paper that we have called um, that studies just feasibility of not just private private signals, but any signals. So the question in that paper, which is called feasible joint, okay, I forget what it's called, but is is which joint belief distributions can players have in, in general? Uh, oh, um, well, yeah, uh, how do you compare those uh, distributions on beliefs? Because previously, in the previous example, when a player got one, as, yeah, here, 
we got uh, beliefs which are higher than 0.9 sometimes. Uh -huh. so, so I don't see how, I mean, what you mean by saying that we don't get, that, that getting three quarters is the best that we can get or something. Okay, like no, no, that's a good question. So actually here, this one, if, if you just look at each player on their own, the signal in this example, Blackwell dominates the signal the, the 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 signal that you get here. So so this this one is more informative than this. But here, what I was saying, imagine that it has to be a binary signal, in the sense that the belief distribution that it induces only takes two values. So so here the belief distribution in the in this example the belief distribution is not binary, right? It it takes it's uniform on zero one. Here it's binary. I have belief either one fourth or three fourth, each with probability one half. And you could ask, is it possible to have a private private structure where my belief is either 0.9 or 0.1, each with probability one half? And that's impossible. Does but that make here, sense? If you, if you color the left hand side by white and the right hand side by blue, then with probability 50%, I know that it is high with probability 50%, I know that it is uh, low and you oh, know nothing. I see, no, I, I want both players to have this structure. Okay. So, so, so imagine that both players have a Q one minus Q binary signal. Okay, I see, thank you. You can't have QB one. It turns out that the highest possible Q you can have is three fourths. Yeah, is, is the mystery, is, is it, yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, so here's an example of how you can get beliefs one third, two thirds. So this is still a binary signal. And if you take a look over here from zero to one third, the belief is, um, is, is one third. Um, here it's also one third, sorry, from zero to half, the belief is one third and from one half to one the belief is, is, is two thirds. Okay, um, what about this one? So what, what, in, in this one, whatever belief I get, whatever signal I get, my belief is a half. So this is a completely trivial signal. Both players get zero information, but note that still the pair S1, S2 completely reveals the state. Right. If I mean, if if somebody were to see both signals, they would know the state, but each player gets zero information. This, this is an important concept, you know, a very simple, important concept from computer science called secret sharing. It's a way to take this this bit omega and split it up between two people without giving any one of them any actual information about this bit. And this turns out to be an important ingredient of our proofs, this this technique. Now, note that in all of these examples that I gave so far, the state omega is determined by the pair of signals. And this is actually not, this is by design. This is not a coincidence. So I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a bit. Um, okay, so I, I wanna talk about an equivalence notion for private-private information structures. So I'm gonna have a private signal SI. It's gonna induce a belief, which I'll denote by P of SI. This is just the posterior that I have um, for the probability that the state is high conditioned on my signal SI. This is a random variable, right? This is some the random belief that I have after I observe a signal SI. And note that if, if omega S1 and S2 is a private private information structure, and then so is omega p of s1 and p of s2, because p of s1 is just a deterministic function of s1. So p of s1 and p of s2 are still going to be independent of each other. So here's a definition. I'm going to say that two private private information structures are equivalent if the distribution of each psi is equal to the distribution of psi prime. So two private private information structures are equivalent if they induce the same belief distributions on the players. Okay. Now, the, the reason why this is an interesting notion is because th this is really the same as each one player structure, omega SI, 
being black will equivalent to omega SI prime. Does anybody need me to define what black will equivalence is? Um, but I mean, you can take this as the definition, but at, if I now have to make some kind of decision that includes the state, I really only care about the posterior belief that my signal induces, the rest is noise. So I might as well throw the rest away and only stay with my posterior belief. And so I'm gonna say the two structures are equivalent if they induce the same posterior beliefs. Okay, and in a very strong sense, these supply the same information to each one of the agents. Any question about this? Okay. Would this, sorry, I mean, um, yeah. would this be the same as a canonical form, like for instance, in correlated equilibria, where the, I mean, in, in correlated equilibria, a, a signal is a recommendation of how to act. Is there some similar canonical structure for what kind of signals you would get in the circumstances? I mean, it's canonical in the sense that if I were to make some kind of decision, imagine that I have some utility that depends on the state and my action, I, I really have no reason to consider any part of my signal except the posterior belief that it induces. So sort of without loss of generality, my action would just be a function of my posterior belief. Okay, so, so the so canonical these, thing is this belief. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so... Uh, in all the examples we had so far, we constructed private private information structures the following way. We fix some prior for the state. We, we fix some subset whose measure is that P. In all our examples, P was one half, and let's call that A. When omega is high, we chose S1, S2 uniformly from A. When omega is low, we chose S1, S2 uniformly from the complement of A, the complement inside the unit square. And um, equivalently, we choose these SI, IID uniformly on zero one, and omega is given by S1, S2 is inside the set A. And we're gonna say that this is the information structure associated with the set A. And in all these structures, you know, these are the examples we had, but you can just take any set A like this one, the pair S1, S2 reveals omega. And you can ask, is this just a big family of examples or is this everything? And the answer is that it's everything. So up to equivalence. So for every private private information structure, there's some measurable set on zero one whose associated information structure is equivalent to I. Okay, so up to equivalence, I can assume that every information structure is like these examples that I constructed where I take some subset of the unit square and that subset is where the state is high and in the rest is where the state is. Deep. Does this make sense? Okay, please, please stop me if you have any questions. Um, so so, so this, this is nice because it, it'll be very useful for us because it really turns the question of studying private private information structures to the question of studying subsets of the unit square. And we're gonna be able to make use of some things that are known about the geometry of the unit square um, that other people have done. Okay, so now I wanna um, ask, um, start talking about our, our, our main question. And here are two examples that we have in this one, this is equivalent to a binary signal, a one fourth, three fourth binary signal. This one's equivalent to a one third, two thirds binary signal. And the signal in example three, the, each one of the signals in example three is Blackwell dominated by the signal in example two. So, okay, I, 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 the, what, what, what this means is that in a very strong sense, there's strictly more information for each agent in example two than in example three. So for those who may not familiar with this notion, it means that agents who have, an agent who has a, um, a, a three-fourth, one-fourth binary signal can generate from that a one-third, two-third binary signal by adding noise to it without any more information about the state. So black hole dominance, one way to think about it is through garbling. When I have two signals are black hole dominated, if I can generate the dominated signal, using the dominating signal by just adding some noise to it, right? So obviously a three-fourth binary signal 
has more information in it than a two thirds binary signal. And what we're gonna ask is, what are the most informative private-private information structures, though they give us about as much information as possible in this Blackwell sense? So, so, so what do I mean? I'm gonna look at two private-private information structures, I and I prime. And I'm gonna say that I dominates I prime if each agent's information about the state and the structure I, Blackwell dominates an information about the state and I prime. So I just look at, I have this order on, on one agent information structures. I'm gonna extend it to an order on two agent information structures in the usual way by asking that, you know, one private private structure dominates if both of the agents signals black will dominate in one structure over the other structure. Uh, Omer, yeah. I have a, uh, something I don't understand in the previous uh, slide. Yeah. You said that one quarter, three quarters is better than one third, two thirds. Yes. I would think that it should be the other way around. Mm, um, oh, no, no, sorry, sorry. No, no, my mistake, sorry. Do you, do you know the story about the, the, the quarter pounders in the United States? So, you in, in know, in McDonald's here, they sell these things called quarter pounders, um, these, these hamburgers. Um, and, and if, you know, a few decades ago, Burger King decided to compete and they started selling third pounders, but they failed because most customers immediately thought that a third pounder was smaller than a quarter pounder. So they, they didn't quite understand why, um, why, why this was a good uh, competition. But yeah, so just because, you know, if you take it to an extreme, three fourths, you know, if this was a 0.99 signal, it's obviously better than a 0.51 signal. Yeah? Omer, does this um, unit square result generalize? Is this one of the results that generalizes? Beyond, it generalizes, yes, to n agents and, and, and n possible values of the state, yes. Th this representation theorem that you can always take this to be, yeah. Um, okay, so so now we, we're going to look about um, we're going to look at um, this this notion, and we're going to say that a private private information is Pareto optimal if it's maximal within this partial order. That just means there is no other structure where one of the players gets strictly more information than in this structure. You know, all players get as much information and at least one player gets strictly more information. That's if you're Pareto optimal, you can just not give the players, any one of the players, any more information. Okay, and the question is, which information structures are Pareto optimal? The answer lies in tomography. So let me explain. Um, what is tomography? So it's a, you know, it's a medical imaging technique. You take, it's a, it's a potato and you, you shine a light through it. So this, this, this yellow thing shines a light in this direction. And here we have a CCD, we, we, ha we have like a, a, a camera and it registers how much light went through the potato along this axis. So you see over here, there's a lot of light that went through because the potato observes some of the light. So you get, so you can figure out at each point how much potato is there above that point by seeing how much light came through, like an x-ray, but I don't think these are usually, I don't know if these are usually x-rays. And the point is what you do is you do this not just in one direction, you do this in many directions. And then you try to reconstruct the shape of the potato by looking at all these projections in all the different directions. Right, so do you, you see the, this line here is supposed to be the projection of this potato in this direction. It's not a projection just, you know, that it's an interval that starts from here and ends here. This actually shows you how much mass there is above each point because that corresponds to how much light got absorbed on the way from the, from the lamp to the detector. So we look at these lower dimensional projections of the object, oh, it is x-rays, I guess, um, and try to reconstruct the object from that. So usually this is done from many different angles, but we're just gonna look at the case where you project twice, once on the x-axis and once on the y-axis. 
And we're going to say that a subset of 0, 1 squared is a set of uniqueness. Oh, and here, this should be two projections. So if it's projections onto the two axes, suffice to reconstruct me. Okay, so a set is going to be a set of uniqueness. If when I project it to the, I tell you it's projection to the x-axis, I tell you it's projection to the y-axis, you can tell me what A is. And here, here's sort of our first main result. And it says the private-private information structure associated with some subset of zero, one squared is Pareto optimal if and only if A is a set of uniqueness. This also holds beyond two dimensions. So I have this shape here, this blue shape. And is this Pareto optimal? Well, that depends on whether this blue area is a set of uniqueness. So let's ask ourselves, here's a little puzzle. We have this blue area. And is this a set of uniqueness? That is, is there another blue subset of zero, one squared, whose projections to the axes are the same as this. What are the projections? These are exactly the beliefs. One fourth here, one fourth here, one half here, one half here, and also here. One half, one half, one fourth, one fourth. So any, I'll give you a second to think about it. Maybe somebody can ask me a question meanwhile. If, or you can tell me the answer. Elon, I see that you got it. Yeah, there are many. Can you give an example? Yeah, just flip the, the small blue. Uh, okay, perfect. Singles. Perfect. So he, these are the projections. And exactly like Elon said, if you flip the blue rectangles, then you have a structure that gives the exact same projections. You have a set that has the same projections. In our language, it induces the same beliefs for the same signals. And because of our theorem, which I haven't proven to you, but this means that this is optimal. I can actually give the players more information. At least one of the players, I can give more information. Okay. Um, so, good. So, so this, is, this is an example of how you disprove that something is parade optimal by finding another set with the same with the same projections. This is what this theorem allows you to do. But how do you prove that something is optimal? How do you prove that a set is a set of uniqueness? So this is something that people have looked at for various reasons. Um, and he, here's one definition. I'm gonna say that a set is upward closed if whenever some point X is in this set A, then all points up and to the right of it are also in this set. So for example, this blue set here is closed. Okay, and I'm going to skip the rest of this slide. Here's an old theorem of Lorentz from 49. Every upward closed set is a set of uniqueness. And every set of uniqueness is upward closed up to equivalence. And this is sort of equivalence in, in, in our sense of equivalence of structures, of having the same distributions of projections. So if you remember, this is the first example that we looked at. This is the one that induces uniform beliefs on the interval zero one. And this blue set is upward closed. So this is actually Pareto optimal. So this is how you prove that this is Pareto optimal. Okay. And in fact, if you look at upward closed sets, so remember we said that all structures are equivalent to something that comes from some set. So the Pareto optimal ones are exactly those that come from upward closed sets. Okay. Um, so I don't have a lot of time. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to skip the, the proof of this. But maybe if people are interested in staying after the hour, I can, I can come back to this. Um, but this is, yeah. Um, okay. So I, I want to, um, th this is one way of thinking about Pareto optimality um, through these sets of uniqueness. And this also um, holds in higher dimensions. But here's an even more concrete way. 
And um, here I also have a question for the crowd. So here's something that seems completely unrelated. I'm gonna F, let F be the CDF of a distribution on zero one with mean P. So, so I have some cumulative distribution function um, of, of some distribution that of a random variable that takes values on the interval zero one. So me, the CDF of the measure on the interval zero one. Now I'm gonna define a new function F hat which is one minus, F minus one here is the inverse of F, evaluated at one minus X. And if F is not a bijection, then okay, you have to make some adjustments, whatever, but these are increasing functions. So they're, they're a lot like bijections, but um, I'm gonna denote F hat is one minus F, one minus the inverse of F defined at one minus X. And actually, so if you think about it, this is the same as taking this graph and rotating it around the anti around the dia this diagonal. If I draw a line connecting this point and this point, and I flip this picture around this line, I get the picture f hat. Okay, so I, I look at the line connecting one zero and zero one, and I flip the image around this line. That's what takes me from f to f hat and back. It turns out that f hat is also always going to be the CDF of something with the same mean. So the question to the audience, I mean, we call these conjugate distributions, but I'm wondering whether this has ever come up. Has anybody seen this sort of thing? Just this very simple observation that if you take a distribution zero one, there's sort of a canonical way to assign to it this, this, this conjugate distribution. Let me know if, you, if you've seen this somewhere, but the theorem is this. A private private structure is Pareto optimal if and only if the belief distributions are conjugates. Now, notice here, if, if you look at this signal here, this somehow corresponds to a pretty informative signal. You see the, the derivative here is big. There's high chance of being very close to zero there's low chance of being close to one half, and there's again, high chance of being close to one. Here, it's the opposite. It's not very informative. The highest derivative is at one half. The derivative is very low around zero and one. So if, if you imagine making this more and more informative by you know, stretching out the flat part, it would make this less and less informative. So this flipping around exactly gives this trade-off the more informative F is, the less informative F hat is and vice versa. So this is exactly, this, this, is, this is somehow captures this trade-off. You cannot make both of them informative. In fact, the more informative you make one, the less informative the other one be get, be, becomes. And these are the Pareto optimal ones. So if you fix F, F hat is the most informative you can make. If, if S1 has distribution F, then the most informative S2 you can have is F hat. So I'll get to that in a bit. Um, I'll get to that now. So we're going to have, uh, this is back to this um, optimal private disclosure. We're gonna have omega S state. We're gonna have S1 as some sensitive or pr protected trait. We're gonna fix the distribution of omega S1, and we're gonna wanna generate a signal S2 that is as informative as possible about omega, but is independent of S1. So it's the same as we wanna find a Pareto optimal private-private information structure, omega S1, S2, with a given omega S1. And Pareto optimality means that generating any strictly dominating signal S2 tilde must violate privacy. So I cannot give more information than this S2 if this is Pareto optimal. And the answer is, this is exactly using these conjugate distributions. There exists a Pareto optimal private-private information structure. For, okay, maybe it's not obvious that it even exists. And it's unique up to equivalence. And in this structure, the belief distributions induced by S1 and S2 are conjugates. Okay, and th there's an interesting maybe a slightly subtle but interesting point here is that this S2 that you get, that's the most informative, 
is unique. So there's a unique maximal element here. There's a unique most informative distribution, even though this is a partial order. So, so, so let, me, let me parse this out. So you know, imagine that I know omega and S1, and I want, I want to tell you S2, give you as much information as possible about omega, but, we'll, but I'm not allowed to tell you anything about S1. So this is the S2 that I would choose. And the point is that no matter what you need to do with this information, I would give you the same S2. This implies, for example, that if I want to maximize S2's mutual information, there's only one way to do this. It's this S2. Whatever decision problem you need to, you face, there's one particular S2 that's most informative. And this, this is not true if you go beyond a binary state, as it turns out. There, depending on what application you have, I might want to send you different S2s, each one of which is, each one of which is Pareto optimal, but they're not going to be comparable between them. Right? Okay. So you could imagine. You could imagine that there's two maximal S2s that I can send you. Neither one of them dominates the other, but both are maximal. This doesn't happen with a binary state. Question? Yeah. Um, so can, how do you define conjugates with more than two agents? We don't, no, okay, so. Is there, it, there sorry, is, is no it only, I mean, when you see binary state also for two agents or all also? No, 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 when, when I, 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 I meant, still with two agents, right? So this is about this optimal disclosure. There is, there's really only one agent. One agent knows omega and S1 and, he, and she, she tells S2 to the other agent, I'm talking beyond binary state. Sure, but I mean, is, I mean it's maybe a different question, but the, the, I wonder how you would even define conjugate signals S1 and S2 with, if, if it's three signals, I mean, that I wouldn't- We don't know, know. we don't have an idea for how to As do that. Good. Yeah, and yeah. in fact, the, 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 this theorem that being Pareto optimal is the same as being a set of uniqueness, that works beyond two dimensions and a binary state. But this thing about conjugate distributions that works out so nicely, that's only for two agents and two possible signals. Um, okay, so I don't have a lot of time. I'm gonna have to skip some things. Um, Okay, I have to decide one second which which ones I'm going to show you. Um, okay, so okay, so let, let's talk about feasibility. Um, we're we're going to fix two belief distributions on on zero one with mean p. The feasibility question is. Does there exist a private private information structure so that, okay, sorry, this should say P of SI, so that these mu i's are the beliefs induced by, by this private private information structure? And then we say that mu one times mu two is feasible. And there, we have some previous work on this um, where we look at the case that mu one and mu two are the same. So we look at mu time structures of the form mu times mu, where both agents get the same belief distributions. And there we say that mu times mu is feasible if and only if mu is a mean preserving contraction of the uniform distribution on zero one. This is the same thing that it's dominated by the example that I gave before of, of, of these um, structure that gives the uniform distribution on zero one. So if both agents get the same, have the same belief distribution, the most informative it can be is that example of the uniform distribution on zero one. Everything else is a mean preserving contraction or black hole dominated by that. What about non-symmetric distributions? So here um, we have this result about conjugates. So mu one times mu two is feasible if and only if mu two is a mean preserving contraction of the conjugate of, of mu one. So, so we get a very, uh, sharp characterization of feasibility for these private private information structures that works even without the the symmetry assumption now i do want to take talk for a second now about what happens with feasibility beyond two players so beyond two players we're going to still talk about a binary stable we'll go beyond two players we don't have a characterization of feasibility 
But what I'm gonna talk about is some necessary conditions that come from information theory. So I'm gonna denote by MI the mutual information of omega with SI. And um, H of P, this is going to be the entropy of a binary random variable with, with expectation P of a Bernoulli random variable with, with parameter P. And, and remember that P is, our, is, our, is the prior that we have for the state. And sort of a, a pretty straightforward information theoretical claim is that in a private-private structure, the sum of mutual informations is at most the entropy of the state. So this is a strong sense in which I cannot give a lot of players a lot of information. The sum of mutual informations that I give in a private-private structure is at most the entropy of the state. This is obviously not true for say conditionally independent private signals where I can reveal the signal to all the players. They all have mutual information which is equal to the entropy of the state and I can have as many players as I want. But in a private-private structures, um, the, the sum of mutual information is at most the entropy. Now, this, this mutual information I can calculate just give, knowing the belief distribution mu i. So this gives a constraint on feasibility. The, a tuple mu one up to mu n is feasible. I can have that as the beliefs of a private private structure um, only if the sum of the mutual informations is at most p. And actually the same holds if instead of looking at mutual information, we look at the sort of reduction of variance. Um, we, we get the exact same theorem, except it works for this M tilde, which is by, by how much um, uh, the, the, the signal reduces the variance of my beliefs. So I, I wanna end with one thing. If, if we go back to mutual information, so the, the sum of these MIs, is it most HP? You can ask, is, is this tight? And the answer that surprised us at least is that it's not tight. And in fact, you can prove a stronger general bound. And the proposition here, this is a fairly standard proof, but the one that I have at the bottom is takes a little bit more work and I think it might have some interest on its own. But if I have, basically what this says, if I have S1 and S2 are independent random variables, then the sum of their mutual informations regarding a third random variable omega is at most the entropy of omega minus some universal constant times the product of their mutual informations. Okay, and this, I think that from an information theory perspective, this is a little bit mysterious to have something that looks like the product of mutual informations, but this, this turns out to be true. This bound itself is also not tight, as far as I know. Um, so so I, I, I think that there might be additional things to, to figure out. That's all I have. Um, I didn't have time to talk about why this fractal comes into play in this work, but it, but it turns out that, that it's, it does in, in some of our proofs, but I'll be glad to discuss this um, in the time that we have now for those who want to stay. Thank you. Thank you. And now uh, it's unofficial discussion time. So if people have questions, now is the time. Okay, so tell us about the fractal. <laughs> <laughs> you got me curious. <laughs> uh, you want to know about the fractal. Um, so, um, yeah, so the, yeah, actually I, I wish I had, um, a, a board, but if you remember the secret sharing, the, the, the way the secret sharing works is that I have a binary random variable and I tell two players independent, you know, I have a half, half binary random variable. I tell I tell two players half, half binary random variables that are independent of each other. And, um, and, and the original random variable omega is a function of these two. In fact, it's the XOR of these two bits. Um, Bernard, you wanted to say something? 
Later. No, no. I mean, I'm. I'm okay. Uh, yes, okay. Okay. On my, my hand. Um, <laughs> so, so one one nice observation is, you know, can you do this when my omega is not a bit, but it's uniform on zero one? So here's the question: Well, how do you take a uniform omega on zero one, construct two independent s one s two? such that omega is some deterministic function of S1 and S2. And the idea is very simple. You think of a uniform random variable on zero one in terms of its binary expansion as a, as a binary fraction. So it's just a sequence of IID zero ones. And you do the same trick to each bit. So you take two real numbers, you write them in there as, as, as two numbers being zero and one, you write them in binary, and then you just take sores of their bits. So this, and so this function is just a function of two numbers, two numbers, it's a function on the unit disk to the interval zero one, and it's the sum of bitwise sores. And this is the graph of this function. So this is related to secret sharing, um, but instead of with bits on, 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 on uni the uniform interval zero one. And it turns out that the graph of this function is this Sierpinski Gaskin. Um, Very nice. That's, that's where this comes from. Very nice, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, well, well, nice. maybe a, just a quick word on that. Yeah. Uh, but if you, if you take uh, X1 and X2 uniformly distributed in zero one, yeah. Then you, you take the sum. If it is less than one, you keep it. If it is bigger than one, you subtract one. It also works, right? Well, but I... Oh, I see. You think that's going to be independent? Yeah. Yeah, of course. If you calculate the conditional yeah, yeah, yeah. F, it's always the identity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. That would have been a simpler way with a less, less, a ni less of a nice picture, but... Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you're just summing up two uniform things on Z on R mod Z. So so the there it's gonna be yeah. okay, next. So my question, if I may, um, I've, I may, I have a slight impression that it relates to what Tristan said at the very beginning. But it's uh, the setup is slightly artificial in the sense that you uh, seem to have to uh, generate the signals first and then then produce um, the state in order to even set this up. I mean, it's um, I mean you you give examples how to do that, but is is it? I mean, a conditional in the, uh, in the, in the conditional independence looks a lot more natural to me. Of course, it is informative, but I mean, isn't that sort of more the natural setup? I mean, uh, can you, my impression is that you have to, in order to construct this private private structure, you have to generate the signals first and then generate the, the state. I mean, that, that's the wrong way to put it, but I mean. I, no, I in, it, you, you know, in, in some sense, you're right. Um, in, in, in some sense, you're, you're right. Um, but I, I think that there are some natural settings where that's the order that things happen. So for example, if you have, um, if you have people voting, maybe independently of each other, and the state is who won the elections, okay. then, okay. you know, I mean, it, there's still information about the state in these, in these sort of, in these signals. And, you know, I, I think people who do causal inference, they're very used to thinking about, I have a few um, things that are independent of each other, they cause something, which is maybe yeah, yeah. okay. Function. I mean, then I accept it, but I think that's almost a caveat. I mean, to the application. I mean, I, I don't know, but I mean, that's my impression. I mean, that's what I said. Yeah. No, I, I I I agree. I think you know, the, the, there's a, something artificial about the whole endeavor, um, but it was it was it's also kind of I, I found it kind of fun to think about. So uh, that that that's what I'm in it for. Are there any more questions? Okay, so I end the recording.